As we've been studying verse by verse through the book of Revelation in our series titled Racing to Revelation, we have taken a three message detour to expand upon and gain greater insights regarding the wonderful truths we've observed in Revelation chapter 21 and the beginning of chapter 22 as we've been answering the key questions about our eternal heaven. So let me invite you to open your Bibles once again to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. I think it's safe to say that the vast majority of people enjoy going on a vacation. As they say, or as they say in most of the world, on a holiday. So what do you think of when you think of a vacation? For some people, they think of lounging on a resort in Mexico or Hawaii or some other wonderful paradise-like place. To others, a vacation may involve a Caribbean or Alaskan cruise with all the amenities that go with it. Still, to others, a vacation would not involve lounging or resting, but traveling to various sites of interest around the world. Still to others, a vacation would involve recreating, like going salmon fishing in Alaska. But as I think of vacations, for some, the anticipation, the expectation, the preparation for going on a vacation is almost as exciting as the vacation itself. And a vacation usually means a change of pace from your normal setting and your normal activities involving some usually enjoyable and rewarding things. You know, for those watching the webcast today from California or Arizona or even England, I thought I would just show a couple pictures of Duluth, Minnesota in April. In fact, this is looking right up the street I live on. I stopped yesterday and took this picture. I thought this is pretty incredible for April 5th. In fact, here's the view right in front of our driveway at the top of our hill. You can see this, the snow bank is almost up to the top of the sign there. And I'm reminded of 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks not for everything, give thanks. And the verse that came to mind when I was shoveling our driveway on Friday was do all things without murmuring and disputing. Can you say with Paul that I have learned in whatever state I am, including Duluth, Minnesota, I've learned to be content. You know, in the grand scheme of things and in light of eternity, some... Manna again, which by the way was white, I don't know if you knew that or not, is not worth losing fellowship over. But even if we don't grumble about the snow right now and you have learned to be content, do not our hearts still long for spring to truly come after this long, brutal winter? And you might have noticed that it seems that more people are taking Spring vacations in Duluth this year. I wonder why. But the problem with vacations, and some of you are going to go on vacation this week, I know, or next week in light of the school breaks. The problem with vacations, they all come to an end. That is to the dismay of some and the delight of others. But did you realize that the believer in Jesus Christ as Savior has an eternal heaven to look forward to that is far better than any vacation you'll ever begin to enjoy on earth? And by the way, would you long for spring if it wasn't for winter? Would you ever long for a vacation if everything was great in your life? 
Would you ever desire retirement if you never worked? Would you ever desire healing if you've never been sick? Would you ever long for a release from your pain if you never had pain? Would you ever desire a new glorified body if your old body was without disease and decay? Would you ever long for a sin-free society unless you had felt the sting of sin and the violation of sinners? Would you really ever desire to meet Jesus Christ face to face if you had never ever come to know him? But this is all part of our problem as Americans. We live in a very materialistic society with instant gratification and we are absorbed with temporal matters and we are prone to neglect what is eternally important. You see, dear friends, this life on earth is designed or allowed by God to prepare us for eternity and to have us long for our eternal heaven that is literally out of this present world. In fact, I am convinced that our eternal heaven is so incredible and so magnificent that we can't really describe or comprehend it well, and we certainly don't deserve any of it, for it's all by God's grace. And unfortunately, unless a person submits to the authority and sufficiency of the Scriptures, they'll be ignorant of what heaven is really like, and they'll be prone to want to fashion a heaven after their own desires or opinions, which many people do today. And even if one does believe the Bible is the Word of God, but they fail to read and study carefully the scriptures, and in particular the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. They'll have an understanding of heaven that is less than what God has revealed and recorded for us in the pages of scripture. And it's this subject of heaven in Revelation 21 and 22, which is what we've had the joy of studying in our last few studies. Now to set the chronological context again, of where we are at in God's plan of the ages and where everything is headed, permit me to, again, review for a little bit. We are presently living here in the church age. In fact, very likely, very towards the end of the church age. How close to the end? Only the Lord knows. We know the next event on God's prophetic plan, again, is the resurrection of the dead in Christ and the rapture of those who are alive to meet the Lord in the air as the bride of Christ. After the signing of the peace treaty, there's a seven-year period called the tribulation on earth in which God pours out his wrath upon the planet and brings Israel to repentance. And it is during that time, at the end of that, that Jesus Christ will return to set up his millennial kingdom. There will be a 75-day interval according to to Daniel chapter 12 in transition in government. It is during that time the rebels in Israel will be again put out. It will be during that time the unsaved Gentiles will be cast into, the, into hell and the saved Gentiles and the saved Jews will enter then into their millennial kingdom along with the glorified saints that have come back with the Lord Jesus or the Old Testament saints that have been resurrected at that time. During the millennial kingdom, there will be a great improvement on this planet. And there will be a renovation of the planet, yet there will still be residue of the curse. At the end of the millennial kingdom, in a final revolt in which Satan and his angels are cast into the lake of fire, and the great white throne judgment occurs in which all the unsaved, whose names are not written in the book of life, are cast into the lake of fire. After that, there is the new heavens and new earth and the new Jerusalem, which we have been studying about. This new Jerusalem is the church's eternal heaven. It is the place that Christ went to prepare for us. And so, we've already considered what are believers doing in heaven right now. We've seen they are with Christ, which is far better. We've seen they are dwelling in the place Christ went to prepare for them. We've seen they are beholding the glory of Jesus Christ. We've seen they are enjoying paradise in the third heaven. 
And frankly, friends, the scriptures do not give us a lot of information about the intermediate state. But one thing is very true. The moment you trust in Christ, you have eternal life. And the moment you die, you are far better. Did you realize that Philip of Macedon, that leader of yesteryear, commissioned a servant who every day would tell him, Philip, you will die, to remind him to make the most of his days, and we should be reminded of that as well. Now that is in great contrast to Francis Louis XIV, who decreed that the word death never be said in his presence because he was afraid to die, didn't want to face death. But we need not fear death as believers in Christ, for the future is as bright as the promises of God. We saw then after the resurrection rapture event, which is going to occur in which the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words, that the raptured church in heaven, during the tribulation on earth, will be casting crowns at Jesus' feet. They'll be singing and worship to the Father and the Lamb. They'll be hearing periodic updates of happenings on earth and waiting for justice to be rendered on earth when the Lord Jesus comes again. They'll be rejoicing in their salvation and they'll be rejoicing when Babylon has fallen and they will be resting from all their, it should just say labors, not laborers, labors, labors. And we know that Revelation 4 and 5 sets forth a profound scene of the worship of God, the Father and the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, around the throne as they are exalted for who they are and what they have done. This is real worship. We then asked and answered the question, well, will there be similarities and differences in the eternal state? And keep in mind that during the millennial kingdom, there will be similarities to what earth was life before the Lord Jesus returned. But there will be profound differences. And ratchet it all up even more when you move from the millennial kingdom to the eternal state. There will be similarities, but there will be differences, and those differences will all be improvements. Improvements, as it were. Look with me again at Revelation 21.1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Notice the similarities. There is a place called heaven, a place called earth, a place called Jerusalem. There's a mention of the sea. There's similarity, but notice this is the new heaven, differences, new earth, new Jerusalem, no more sea. There's differences. And again, as I tried to demonstrate last week, that Christ went to prepare a place for us. Imagine this hymn book to be that place. When a person dies today, they go to that new Jerusalem, which is in the throne room of God. During the millennial kingdom, we will either live there or the new Jerusalem will be suspended above the earth. We will have access to the earth for sure. We will be living in the new Jerusalem. Where that is exactly, there's some debate. But in what we've just read, the new Jerusalem comes and rests upon the new earth where also the new heavens are and wherein dwelleth righteousness. And so keep in mind, there's this eternal capital city, but also there's this new earth and new heavens that are all be present. And there are similarities. In fact, go to chapter 22 with me, if you would. Chapter 22. Verse 1, and he showed me a pure river of the water of life. Now, I want you to just notice here, in the New Jerusalem, there's a river. There's a river. Similarity, but notice different. Pure river. Where do you find that on this planet? Water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, that's a difference. We don't see that today on this earth. 
In the middle of its street, notice similarity. It has streets. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits. Similarities. But each tree yielding its fruit every month. You know any trees like that? And by the way, the phrase month indicates there is time and space in this new Jerusalem. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. The Greek word for healing is the word in which we get therapeutic. It's not that it's necessary, but apparently it's very enjoyable, as it were. And there shall be no more curse. Now that's different. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. That's different. And his servants shall serve him. That's sometimes different. Because some believers today don't seem to get off the dime when it comes to serving the Lord. But again, as we think of the New Jerusalem, if you, could, if you were able to open the pearly gates of the New Jerusalem, our eternal heaven, and you could see in, you would see this amazing scene we're reading about with some similarities but significant differences as we think of the new heaven, new earth, and in particular, the New Jerusalem. But it's like when Marco Polo returned to Italy from the court of Kublai Khan. He described a world his audience had never seen, one that could not be understood without the eyes of imagination. Not that China was an imaginary place, but it was very different from Italy. Yet, as two locations on the planet Earth Inhabited by human beings, it had much in common. And the reference points of Italy allowed a basis of understanding of China. And the differences could be spelled out from there. And that's what we have here. Apart from this earth, we would not have reference points to be able to even envision what is a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, and a river, and a water, and trees, and fruit, and so forth. So there are similarities, but significant differences. And as I already mentioned, will there be space and time in our eternal heaven? Absolutely. Space will be needed for the new Jerusalem. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Heaven is a real place. Heaven, hell is a real place. The New Jerusalem was some 1,400 to 1,500 square miles in three directions, the shape of a cube with a surface area of at least 2.25 million square miles, which all requires space. 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 Space where there will be structures and where you will be able to function in your resurrected and glorified bodies. There will be streets of gold. And there will be time. As we see, every month a new fruit comes forward. Month indicates time. And by the way, time is not bad in itself, but we'll, we'll live with time but no longer live under its pressures. Furthermore, we asked who will be the focus of eternal heaven. And again, our focus is going to be God. You see, all this is not about you. It's about God. Revelation 21.3, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold the tabernacle. God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them. They will be their God. There shall be no more curse, 22.3, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. God dwells in heaven, but he is not contained there as he transcends space. But the new Jerusalem is uniquely his home, his center of operations, his command posts. It is the place where his throne resides. And we saw at the end of Revelation 21, verse 11, that the holy Jerusalem is, will be descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And Jesus Christ and the Father will, and the Holy Spirit will be there. What will be forever missing from our eternal heaven? We saw in Revelation 21.4. 
God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. John 22, 3 told us there shall be no more curse. You know, heaven is described not only by what's there, but what's not there. What's there is the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. What's there is God dwelling among his people. What's there is the redeemed over all the ages. What's there is this tremendous, beautiful city. What's there is a place wherein dwelleth righteousness. No sin. But notice what is not there. There's no more sea because all chaos and disorder symbolized by the sea in ancient times will be gone. No more tears because all hurt will be removed. No more death because mortality is swallowed up by life. No more mourning because all sorrow will be perfectly comforted. No more crying because all joy will reign supreme. No more pain because all diseases will be expelled. No more thirst because every desire will be satisfied. No more wickedness because all evil will be banished. No more temple because God will be everywhere. No more night because the glory of God will shine. No more need for protection and security. You will live in a new Jerusalem with gigantic walls and no threats. No more closed gates because God's access will be open all the time. And no more curse because the death of Jesus Christ has lifted it. Can I add a couple more? No more weight loss programs. And I'm pretty sure no more snow. Based on this comforting list, and in light of these things, just think, dear friends, how there will be no more funeral homes, no hospitals, no abortion clinics, no divorce courts, no brothels, no bankruptcy courts, no psychiatric wards, no treatment centers. There'll be no pornography, no human trafficking, no sexual morality, no teen suicide, no AIDS, no cancer, no rape, no missing children, no drug problems, no drive-by shootings, no racial tension, and no prejudice. There'll be no misunderstandings, no injustice, no depression, no hurtful words, no gossip, no hurt feelings, no worry, no emptiness, and no child abuse. There'll be no more wars, no financial worries, nor emotional heartaches, nor physical pain, nor spiritual flatness, no relational divisions, no murders, and no political lies. There'll be no more tears, no suffering, no separations, no starvation, no accidents, no emergency departments, no doctors, no nurses, no heart monitors, no rust, no false teachers, no false religion, no financial shortages, no hurricanes, no bad habits, no decay, and no locks needed. You'll never need to confess sin. You'll never need to apologize again. You'll never need to straighten out a strained relationship. You'll never have to resist Satan again. You'll never have to resist temptation again. And on and on we could go. And I adapted that from a list I read. We also answered last week, what is the significance of our future bodily resurrection? And what is significant again, Philippians 3, 20 and 21, is that our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that may be conformed to his glorious body. And so we ask the question, so what was Christ's body like? After the resurrection, well, he could walk and talk and had functionality. He was able to disappear. He was able to walk through closed doors. He was identifiable and recognizable. He was physical in appearance with all five senses. He was able to eat but not needing to eat. He was able to travel through the heavens. And if our body is going to be like his, then what will we be able to do and not do with our glorified bodies we will be able to walk and talk with functionality. We will be able to disappear, walk through closed doors, be identifiable and recognizable, be physical in appearance with all five senses, eat but not need to eat, travel through the heavens. 
Wow. Remember, the New Jerusalem is the church's residency, but we're not confined there. We will be able to travel the new earth and the new heavens. But one thing is clear, even before we get to that New Jerusalem, that when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3.3. 3. Now you might wonder, well, will we have our own homes in our eternal heaven? And I believe the answer to that question is, is yes. In fact, what did our Lord say in John 14? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Notice many. Notice houses, singular. Mansions are plural. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. A place for you where? In my Father's house and those many mansions. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. There where I am, there you also may be. You may be also. Now remember, having resurrected bodies, we will occupy space. And the analogy that is being used here was the marriage motif in which what would happen is during the betrothal, the groom would go back to his father's house and build on a room for his bride-to-be. And that is why it's interesting how this is translated in some other translations. John 14, 2, In my father's house are many rooms. English Standard Version. New American Standard, In my father's house are many dwelling places. The Net Bible, There are many dwelling places in my father's house. The NIV, My father's house has many rooms. That's the idea. When you say mansion, some of you think of this Huge place waiting for me, you know. Well, heaven's going to be huge. The New Jerusalem is huge. But the word mansions is better translated rooms or a dwelling place, perhaps a house of some kind. And since God loves diversity, it could... It would be consistent with his character that the houses of the New Jerusalem would have diversity as well. And since the New Jerusalem is a city of people, structures, streets, walls, rivers, trees, etc., it stands to reason that there will be hundreds of millions of residences there where people dwell all in the Father's house, the New Jerusalem. In addition, I believe it's safe to assume that those who live in the New or on the New Earth outside of the capital city of the New Jerusalem will also live in houses or homes as well. Where else will they dwell? And so, dear friends, all of this is an incredible, somewhat indescribable place, almost beyond imagination. Yet what God says is absolute reality and guaranteed in the future. One day, every believer in Christ will have not only a redeemed soul, but function within a resurrected or transformed body, enjoying a risen Savior on a recreated earth and heaven while residing in the new Jerusalem. Now another question people are curious to know, will we recognize and identify people in our eternal heaven? The answer is an absolute yes. In fact, turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Keep in mind that you are you. And you will be you throughout all eternity. I want to ask you a question. When Christ rose from the dead, was he recognizable? Answer? Yes. Was he identifiable? Yes. If that was true of our Lord Jesus Christ, and where bodies are fashioned like his, why would we not be identifiable and recognizable? In Luke 24, verse 39, we read, 
verse 38, and he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. In that resurrected body, he had hands. In that resurrected body, he had feet. That it is I myself. He hadn't, he was still the same person, identifiable. By the way, was he still male in gender? Absolutely. Absolutely. I had someone ask me after the service last Sunday, so will there be gender in heaven? Because I don't want to be a man. This was a woman, by the way, saying this. And I said, rest assured, you will not be a man. The Lord Jesus was still fully male, though glorified. And by the way, those are the best kind of males. Glorified kind. Notice, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Notice, personality is clearly there. Personhood is clearly there. Identification is clearly there. In fact, go to John chapter 21. And in John 21, verses 4 and si- through 7, again, here's Peter is fishing. Verse 4, and when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Who stood on the shore? Jesus was the identifiable, reckon- yes. It's still Jesus. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitudes of fish. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord... John said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. Notice it was the Lord. Hadn't changed, still identifiable, still recognizable. Yes, at times they didn't immediately recognize him because they weren't anticipating him, per se. But will others be identifiable? Go to Luke chapter 9 with me. Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, we have one of the gospel accounts of the transfiguration. And in Luke chapter 9, we begin in verse 28. Now it came to pass about eight days after these things that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And Peter meant Peter, and John meant John, and James meant James. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men, notice they were men, males, talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who had previously died, but they were still men, and they were still Moses, and they were still Elijah, not some nameless, faceless individuals. Verse 31, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But, Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. But notice, Peter was able to recognize and identify Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Now, I don't know if there was some word of introduction, but there's no mention of it in the text. But what I'm after is, were they identifiable? Yes. Were they recognizable? Yes. Were they still the same person? Yes. But in a glorified state. Now, go with me to Matthew chapter 8 for a moment. In a passage we looked at recently in our study regarding outer darkness. In 
The context is this Gentile who believed in the Lord and in a sense put to shame the unbelief of Israel. And he says in verse 11, I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died long ago, but were they still Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And would people enjoy their fellowship and company at the wedding feast? And would they be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Still identifiable? Still recognizable? Absolutely. In fact, think of the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Was Lazarus still Lazarus? And Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. Was Abraham still Abraham? Were they recognizable? Absolutely. And by the way, did they have memory? Do you remember that in your lifetime, Lazarus, you had nothing, but the rich man, you had, you had a lot. Do you remember? Was there memory? Absolutely. They had reasoning ability to the point that the person that was in the torment side of Hades said, would you please send someone to go talk to my five brothers so they don't join me here? Was there reasoning ability? Yes. Did they maintain their distinct identities from earth? Yes. Think about when the prophet Samuel was called up by King Saul in 1 Samuel 28. Was he still Samuel? Yes. In fact, go to Job 19 with me for a minute. Job 19. Verses 25 through 27. Job writes, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. After my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Notice, I is still Job. Identifiable, recognizable Job whom I shall see for myself, and my eye shall behold, and not another. Now watch this. How my heart yearns within me. And my heart yearns within me to one day see the Lord, my Redeemer. My heart yearns within me one day to go home to be with the Lord. In fact, I ask you a question. If we're to comfort one another with the idea that one day the Lord, the dead in Christ, will rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, how can we really be comforted concerning the death of our saved loved ones who have gone on ahead if we won't be able to recognize and identify them at the rapture? And at the judgment seat of Christ which follows the rapture, will you be identified? Will you be recognized? And will you be rewarded accordingly? Absolutely. Now go to Isaiah 66 for a moment. While you're in the Old Testament, Isaiah 66. And there are just a few references in the Old Testament to the new heaven and new earth. Isaiah 66 is one of them. For in Isaiah 66, I want you to find verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And by the way, your name identifies you. And by the way, are there not names written in the Lamb's book of life? Don't the names identify these individuals? Will there not be the names of tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel which identify them, or the 12 apostles of our Lord which identify them in the new Jerusalem? So people will be recognizable, people will be identifiable, which leads logically to another question about heaven that people want to know, namely, will we have relationships with others? In heaven. 
Again, the answer to that question is clearly yes. We are relational beings. God created us to have relationships. Relationships with Him, relationships with others. In fact, I can't wait to see my mother, my former pastor, my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, Rod Carbon, and on and on we go. In fact, you know, I have an old, my oldest sister is in heaven. I never knew her. You see, my dad proposed to my mom on their first date. They were married a year later on his birthday so he wouldn't forget their anniversary. <laughs> and my mom got pregnant on her wedding night. And five months later, she miscarried. So I have a sister in heaven. Now, have you ever thought about miscarried babies or young children in heaven? Will they, what form will they have? Well, I'll tell you this. How can you have a relationship with a miscarried baby? They obviously will have to have maturity, the ability to communicate in fellowship if you're going to have relationships. You say, well, how will you look then? You'll be your best, I assure you. I really don't know. But I know this, that heaven is filled with relationships with God and others. And even at the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's going to be a time of feasting, which is a common expression of fellowship. There's going to be times of festivity and banqueting and fellowship. In fact, banqueting involves eating. And in the millennial kingdom, at least we know, in that the lion will lay with the lamb, and so forth and so forth, that they will eat meat yet in the millennial kingdom. So, well, what about in the eternal state? Will you eat meat? And I love meat. But if there's no more death, it's pretty hard to have meat. Do you like fruit? There's going to be, I think, a lot of fruit. And who knows what else. But you know, and as I think of relationships in 1 Corinthians 13, what did the, how did the chapter end? Now abides faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Greatest in what sense? For without faith, you can't please the Lord. And hope is something God wants us to have. But faith and hope go away in the future when we're with the Lord and in the eternal state. But what still will remain? Love. And to love, you have to have an object of love. And that's where relationships all come in. By the way, being created in the image of God, you are created with the mentality, emotion, volition, and conscience along with the human spirit. Now, I personally believe that animals have souls. They do not have human spirits. But they don't have human souls. They have animal souls. Because can animals think? Can they feel? Can they choose? Do they even have some sense of right or wrong? Do they know when they've been naughty? They do, don't they? But it's an animal soul, not a human soul. But in addition to a human soul, we have a human spirit, and that's why we worship. That's why we have a God consciousness. They do not have that. They do not have that. Now you say, well, if we're going to have relationships with others in heaven, you may wonder, in heaven, will some people still be annoying? After all, eternity is a long time, right? And what will be wonderful about heaven is it will be perfect relation fellowships without sin. Can you imagine fellowshipping with Old Testament characters like Adam and Eve and Abel and Noah and Job and Jonah and Daniel? Can you imagine fellowshipping with New Testament characters like the apostles, Mary, Joseph, Lazarus, John the Baptist, Mary and Martha, Cornelius, the Philippian jailer, Ethiopian eunuch? Can you imagine fellowshipping with other believers you've heard about like George Mueller, Hudson Taylor, Jim Elliott, C.I. Schofield, or whoever? And you can form your own list of the redeemed. 
You are going to have relationships with others as long as they were redeemed or saved by the grace of God. Now, piggybacking off the last question, or this question, you may be wondering, I did have a yes there. Will we still be married and relate to our redeemed family in our eternal heaven? And you need to turn to Matthew 22. Matthew chapter 22. Hey, Steve, can you turn that just this way a little more? In just the top. There you go. Thanks. Matthew chapter 22. And let's pick it up. Well, before we pick it up, let me lay the, the context. The Sadducees approach the Lord Jesus Christ. They were the theological liberals of Jesus Christ's day. They didn't believe in the supernatural or the afterlife, unlike the Pharisees who taught that after the resurrection, each person would have the same relationship he had on earth. They believed that men would remain married to their earthly wives and retain their earthly families forever. Thus the Sadducees seek to trap our Lord. And in verse 24, they're saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. And that is what the Old Testament law said. Now there were with us seven brothers, and the first died after he had married and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second, also on the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. No wonder, seven husbands. Funny she didn't die earlier, you know. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her as their wife. Now watch what Jesus says here, verse 29. He answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Let me pause for a minute. How many people in our day are mistaken? How many people in our day are mistaken about how to go to heaven? How many people are mistaken about what heaven is like? How many people are mistaken about the plan of salvation and on and on? Why? Because they do not know the scriptures the power of God. Verse 30, for in the resurrection, and Jesus clearly believed in a future bodily resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given, but are like angels of God in heaven? What this is teaching is that angels don't marry and neither will we be married in heaven. We need marriage on the present earth for it's not good that man should be alone. But the institution of marriage will be ended at that point. Nor do angels have sex or procreate and neither will we. For the context of that is marriage, which will no longer exist. There will be no need in heaven of what marriage provides for us on earth. Now what this is not teaching is that we will be angels in heaven. It doesn't say that. We will be like the angels of God in heaven. And I say that because some people think, oh, when you die, you become an angel. No, you don't become an angel. You're still you. Now that is not to suggest, though, that the deep relationships with saved people that we've enjoyed on earth will no longer exist in heaven, including our mates and children. If your mate is saved and you've enjoyed a deep relationship with them in time, why would you not enjoy a deep relationship with in heaven or with your children. And they'll still have been your mate on earth and they still will have been your children on earth. And you will still enjoy great relationship with them, maybe better than now. In fact, for sure better than now. 
Now, when I said you're not going to be married in heaven, some people think, oh, yeah. yeah. Others are like, depending on the kind of marriage you may have. But one thing will also be true is your family, in a sense, will be expanded because you're part of the family of God and you're going to be able to enjoy deep fellowship. But if you do have memory, and you do, but it'll be viewed with perfect righteousness. Why can't you enjoy those relationships in a tremendous way? They're just, they're just no longer your wife or your husband or your children in that sense that they were before. But these deep relationships will not be limited, again, to a mate or children or so forth. Now here's an important question related to that. Will we have memory in heaven? And if so, how will we enjoy heaven while knowing some friends or family are not there? And it's very clear from the book of Revelation there will be people that won't be in heaven. The unsaved, the unforgiven, those who have never had their sins washed away will not be there. But keep in mind, dear saints, that happiness in heaven is not based on ignorance, but on a right perspective, God's perspective. And thus, as you understand the gospel and how we all deserve an eternal hell because God is holy and we have sinned, but God is offering all us eternal life and an eternal heaven because Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again to save us. And God has repeatedly appealed to man through various means and convicted man of the truth of the gospel that we will recognize in the future everything from God's perfect standpoint. Kind of like the wedding feast in Matthew 22 that we read about here a couple Wednesday nights ago. The appeal was made, the invite was made, we're not willing to go. Another invite was made, no, we're not interested, we're too busy. Now I do believe there is memory in heaven. In fact, I'd like you to turn to Isaiah 65. I do not know that we will remember everything, but I do know that whatever we remember, we will look at perfectly. Righteousness will pervade. But there is a verse that sometimes is misunderstood, Isaiah 65, if you go there. Verse 17, so he says, for he says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. And some people use the second half of that verse to say, see, notice, nothing will be remembered or come to mind. The former. But the former is in context in reference to verse 16. So that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. He who swears in the earth shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten because they are hidden from my eyes. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former, former what? Troubles shall not be remembered or come to mind. You see, heaven is a place of perfect joy of perfect peace, of perfect comfort. George McDonald was asked, if we will remember people when we are in heaven and equipped, shall we be greater fools in paradise than we are now? Erwin Lutzer writes, and I quote, if God can be content knowing that unbelievers are in hell, so will we. I expect that all who are in heaven will live with the knowledge that justice was fully served and that God's plan was right. And with such an explanation and perspective, our emotions will mirror those of our Heavenly Father. Jonathan Edwards said that heaven will have no pity for hell, not because the saints are unloving, but because they are perfectly loving. They will see everything in conformity with God's love, justice, and glory. Thus, with both head and heart, we will worship the Lord without regret, sorrow, or misgivings about our Father's See, keep in mind, everyone deserves hell. No one deserves heaven. It's all by his grace, for by grace are you saved 
through faith. We'll never question God's justice, wondering how he could condemn the unsaved to hell, for he sent his son to die for them. He sent his Holy Spirit to convict them. He gave his truth in conscience, creations in Christ to reveal himself to them, but they chose to reject God's truth and to reject God's son. Rather, we'll be overwhelmed with the grace of God, marveling what he did for us through Calvary's cross in order to save us by his grace. Now here's another question. Will we, we be discovering things in our eternal heaven? And again, the answer is, is yes. Being flawless doesn't mean that we still won't be finite and not knowing everything is not a flaw. We'll have perfect knowledge, but not complete knowledge, since we're not omniscient. In fact, I'm convinced we'll be learning from our Lord. Did he not say, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away? Why do we need his word forever if there's not things to learn? We'll be learning from our Lord. I think we'll be learning from others. We'll be learning about the new heavens. We'll be learning about the new earth. We'll be learning about the new Jerusalem. You will experience the discovery channel like never before. And by the way, being the new earth, there'll be many places to see. Being the new heaven, there'll be new galaxies perhaps to discover. It'll be an amazing scene and there'll be much to learn as we think of the new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. Will there be good angels in our eternal heaven? And again, the answer is, is yes. We won't be angels, but we'll be with angels, which is far better. And we know from the Bible there are thousands upon thousands of angels. One-third of them rebelled with Satan. Two-thirds serve God as ministering spirits, and you'll have an opportunity to visit with them. Wouldn't you like to say, hey, tell me, Gabriel, what was it like? Or, hey, Michael, Michael, I've got a question to ask you. I mean, wow. Next question, is our eternal heaven a beautiful place? Do you remember the description of chapter 21? It's a place of unparalleled visual magnificence and splendor that pushes human language to the limit. Perhaps you'd like to visit various cities or you'd like to visit various countries today to see their structures, people, etc. Can you imagine what it'll be like then? It'll be a place of incredible beauty, of incredible wealth. On the one hand, it's called the city, but also it's like a garden in the new Jerusalem and then there's the new heavens and new earth as well. An amazing scene of beauty and splendor a beautiful, beautiful place. And we saw some of the stones that were even used in the New Jerusalem. Will you be bored in heaven? Ume, never. Now, some are very mistaken, like the man who said, and I quote, I can't stand the thought of endless tedium to float around in the clouds with nothing to do but strum a harp. It's all so terribly boring. Heaven doesn't sound much better than hell. I'd rather be annihilated than spend eternity in a place like that. And by the way, that was the pastor who said that, who was ignorant of the Bible. That's not what heaven's going to be like at all. Dear friends, Eternal hell will be an agonizing, dull, and insignificant place without company, without purpose, without accomplishment. A place of everlasting fire and outer darkness of total isolation. On the other hand, Psalm 1611 says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You will not be bored in heaven, I assure you. Next question, will there be ethnic and national differences and identities in our eternal heaven? Do you remember what we studied in Revelation 21? And the nations, ethnos, people groups of those who were saved, only the saved are there, 
shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it, the new Jerusalem. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And I pointed out when we studied this that in the new Jerusalem, the redeemed church will live. The redeemed Jews who were not part of the church, either before the church or during the tribulation, will live. That will be their residence with access to the new heaven and new earth. But outside of the New Jerusalem will be the redeemed Gentiles who lived prior to the church or after the rapture of the church who will bring their glory and honor into it. And that's why in Revelation 5, in that scene in heaven, you see people out of every kindred and tribe and tongue and nation. Now that raises some questions. Will there be functional differences in heaven? In service to the Lord in our eternal heaven. By the way, notice, did you notice the kings of the earth? That means these people groups, these nations have kings. They have some kind of governmental structure. And if you look at Revelation chapter 22 for a moment, if you go there very quickly... Verse 3, Revelation 22, 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall do what? Serve him. Service does involve work. By the way, is work sin? Was there work before the fall? Did Adam have a job in the garden before the fall? Yes. Work existed before the fall. However, the fall made work much harder. And the curse will be reversed, but we still need purpose and function, as it were. And we will have it. We will be serving him. In fact, notice here, there are some who are going to be actually kings of the earth as well. And we know from Revelation that we will be kings and priests to our God. So we will have different functions and purposes. See, some of you can lay by a beach for hours and soak in the sun. I can't at all. If I go to a beach, it's for 20 minutes so I can sit out on the Kubana after and read or do something productive, as it were. But we all are different, and there's going to be vacation-like situations and service-like situations in eternity future. Now that raises another question. What language will we speak in our eternal heaven? Remember, I told you it was Polish, because it takes all eternity to learn. But <laughs> some have said, no, it's Finn. Why? Because Jesus said, it is finished. No, but whatever language it is, it will be a shared language that all can understand and communicate with. Otherwise, how could you have fellowship if you can't communicate? It'll be like it was before the Tower of Babel because before the Tower of Babel, they all spoke in one language. Now, it could be multilingual. That's possible. That we all have a shared language, but since there's different people groups, nations, could it be they might have their own language and dialect? Could be. You've heard the saying, what do you call someone who speaks three languages? Trilingual. What do you call a person who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call a person that speaks one language? American. Will we all live in the same place and be the same in our eternal home? And the answer to that is no. Again, some live in the New Jerusalem, some live on the New Earth. Residency in New Jerusalem, but access to the New Earth and Heaven. Residency in the New Earth, but access to the New Jerusalem and the New Heaven. The saved Gentiles, again, have their residency outside the city in the New Heaven, but access into the New Jerusalem. Now, how does all of this apply to you? You know, for, as a, for the believer in Christ, the future is as bright as the promises of God. I mean, this is incredible. 
What a future do you have to look forward to? Better than any vacation or retirement on earth in the presence of your Lord Jesus Christ. And by virtue of the fact that you already have been crucified with Christ and buried with Christ and raised with Christ, yea, seat in the heavenlies in Christ, no wonder we're told if you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above not on things on the earth. For you died in the past, and in the present your life is hidden with Christ in God, and in the future when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We are to live a life in which we redeem the time, a Christ-centered life, a life that's lived in view of our position in Christ, and a life that is oriented to heaven. And when you begin to think that way, it transforms a lot of things down here, and it causes, in the grand scheme of things, for you to view a lot of things as that's nothing. And when you don't think that way, you can get bent out of shape about a broken fingernail. You know, I'm also reminded in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. You know, what God has given to you, he wants you to enjoy it, but you use it as a steward, and it's best enjoyed when he's always first. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. They might really grasp what eternal life is all about and live in light of eternity and therefore let their lives count for Jesus Christ now and in doing so, store up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. And you've got to remember, friends, Just like Philip of Macedon. Philip, you will die. And as a believer, one day, unless the Lord comes, you will die. And there's no pockets and shrouds. There's no U-Hauls behind hearses. And when you die, the things that eternally matter will still eternally matter. Jesus Christ, the Word of God and people. Put your life in perspective. But it could be that you're here today and you're without Christ. You've never been saved. And the question is, where will you spend eternity? What's the value of learning about heaven if you don't know how to get there or you don't know that you're going? What's the value? There is no value. And the Bible's very clear, you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. As one person wrote, heaven's wedding banquet will not just mean going down the service elevator to the garage. It'll mean being cast into hell forever. And you know what is so amazing is while we all deserve the judgment of God, for we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the good news is that Jesus Christ suffered God's wrath in your place and mine. That he died for us. That he paid for our sin. You want to see the love of God? You just remember what Jesus Christ did for you. You say, well, I don't like that God will send people to hell. The fact is, he didn't want anyone to go to hell. That's why he sent his son, and that's why on the cross, Jesus Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because our sin was laid on his son. And he was experiencing spiritual death, separation from God, bearing the equivalent of our hell for us on that cross so that we could escape it. And on the third day, he rose again to give us eternal life as a gift. And all who simply put their faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work have eternal life now and have a wonderful future to look forward to. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he didn't lie, and he was telling the truth. 
Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ alone to save you? Believing that he died for your sins and rose again so that you bank your eternal destiny on him and his finished work and not your works or the rituals and rites of a church or a religion. For by grace you've been saved through faith. That not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your wonderful, wonderful word. Wow, what a future to look forward to for every believer. But it also impresses upon us, dear Father, the importance of redeeming the short amount of time we have here. As believers, living for Christ, living in light of eternity, living by faith in obedience to your will, and capturing these moments you give us to serve our Lord Jesus Christ and to impact others with the gospel. And Father, our hearts go out to those loved ones of ours who are not yet saved. And we pray for their salvation. And we pray that we would remember that one thing we cannot do in heaven is lead lost souls to Christ. Thank you again that we can worship you now, we can serve you now, that now is preparation for eternity. Thank you, like as we long for spring here in Minnesota, that we can long for the day that we go home to be with you and experience no more death and no more pain, no more suffering, no more crying, no more tears, no more curse, no more sin but enjoy your presence. Enjoy your fellowship and the fellowship of those who have gone before us and in the eternal state to enjoy the fellowship of those saved and redeemed throughout all the ages and for all eternity. Father, we know that in your word you've sought to explain what you deemed necessary for us to understand and yet recognizing we can't fully comprehend it. But that doesn't mean we can't enjoy it and, and allow it to put a perspective on the suffering of this present time which are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. So Father, I pray that you could use this series in our hearts to give us a new appreciation for you, for your love, for your mercy, for your grace, for your Son, for our salvation, our security, your promises, our future, and and even a, a new and renewed desire to win the lost to Christ and to redeem the time we have in walking with and serving Jesus Christ and not being waylaid and distracted and detoured by the unnecessary distractions of this life. I pray you would refine our focus and you would renew our perspective and we would live with divine viewpoint resonating in our thinking the very mind of Jesus Christ. And it makes us, Father, all the more wanting to see our Savior face to face. And we thank you for him who loved us and gave himself for us. In Jesus' name, amen. going to close our service this morning by singing a song about heaven. Heaven came down, number 371 in our hymnals. Let me just underscore what this is about, that we have no future in heaven for sure unless there was a day in the past or perhaps even the present right now today in which we've been born again. Thank the Lord for the fact that Jesus came down to meet us Heaven came down and God offers salvation as a free gift 
by faith in Christ alone. And so we have this glorious future to look forward to if we're born again. Let's stand and sing about that in 371. Heaven came down. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above into God's family divine, justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made When as a sinner I came Took of the offer of grace he did proffer He saved me, oh praise his dear name Heaven came down and glory filled my soul When at the cross the Savior made me whole my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believed. Riches eternal and blessings supernal from his precious hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day.